<laughs> did you have, did you really have a question? Or? Okay, in line. All right. Here's here's our goal for today. Our goal for today is three pieces. First piece is to talk about doing a query that has no visual part, no visual component. In other words, we're doing a query as part of our processing. That is, we're not, we're doing a query and we're not displaying the results, but we're using the results in some other manner. And if you remember where we left off last time, we were doing a little, little like movie queue where you would add movies to the queue. And what we want to do specifically in this case is we want to update our queue and everything that we add in to the queue, we want to get the next sequence number. So the first item that we get when we add it goes to position one. The second item goes to position two. Now again, if we were rewriting Netflix, we'd have some code to rearrange those as well. But by default, it goes to the end of the queue. So <clears throat> that's the first thing we're going to do. The, uh, the second thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about state and remembering state is sort of synonymous with remembering and that is passing values to multiple pages. We've been passing values since like the first, you know, the first week or so of class, or second week of class, from a page to itself. So we display, you know, we, we have a form that the user enters data in, you click on a button to submit the data, that data goes back to itself. So we're remembering that data, all right? We also are passing data from one page to another when we create the query string, all right? The query string is a way of remembering what thing we clicked on on the first page and what, what we want to see the detail of. So what we're, gonna, what we're looking at is the ability to go and to pass between a bunch of different pages. And, and the classic example of that would be like for a logon. In other words, when we log on to a site, we don't want to have to log on every time we visit a page. We want to log on once and then have it remember who we are, remember our credentials for every page we go. So that's going to require a different technique than we have discussed so far. All right. Finally, we have the course evaluation. Um, <laughs> I always wonder, like, how important is a lecture I have that day? Like, you know, <laughs> the folks going to say all he did was talk about video games because I did that this morning. I always points. Pardon me? Yeah, that, you're right. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. That may that may actually help me. I didn't think of that. Um, at any rate, I'm trying to pull up my notes here. Um, let's start by doing a query um, that doesn't have a visual part. A query so that we can pull the sequence number to increment it. All right. Now let's let's talk about this. If I remember, we had um, three tables. We had a user ID or a user table whose key was a user ID, and there were other. Uh, uh, attributes associated with it. We had a movie table that had a movie ID and some attributes associated with it. And then we had a queue table that had not really sure how this was structured, but probably has a user ID and has a movie ID. I can't remember if we use a surrogate key or not or if these two are the key. Doesn't really matter for what we're doing. We have a position. We have, but yeah, we do have a position. All right. 
And the idea of the position is that it's a position in the queue. So the first thing we want to be in position one. The second thing we add, we want to put to position two, and so on. Again, we could have code to rearrange that on some other page, but we're not worried about that. So if I have a user ID, all right, and let's say I have user ID one, movie one, position one, user ID one, movie three, position two. What would the SQL statement be to determine, or, or let me rephrase that. Describe how I would determine the position of the next row that I want to insert for that user. We know that the next row, the position, whatever it is, should be three. Right? Because we're just adding on to it. So, you know, the first movie, position one. The second one, position two. The third one, position three. All right? Makes sense. Let's discuss what the algorithm is to determine that. Well, tell me if this makes sense. I always, whenever I'm doing a project, and, and I would really make this suggestion to students too, I would think about the tasks that you need to perform, and then do an inventory of what you know and what you don't know. All right? And then that gives you something to focus on and to look at. You know, you're not going to get to that point if you just sort of dive in. But if you sit back, take a step back and plan and think what you need to do, and then of those steps, which you know, which you don't know, it allows you to focus, I think, a little better. So, tell me if this makes sense. The algorithm would be to first get the highest position currently in the database for that user. All right? So, if we haven't added this one yet, we would want to get that the current, the current highest position for this user is 2. Then the new position will be the highest position. database, right? All right. 
what kind of select statement do I want to use or what what do I want to use if I don't want to know? Do I need to know the specific movie that's in the highest position? No. Do I need to know all of the movies and all of the positions? No. I just need to know the highest position. All right? So, what kind of SQL statement, what's my SQL statement going to look like? What's it going to have in it? Could have a count, all right? What's a general term for things like count and sum and that sort of thing? An aggregate function, all right? So it's probably going to have an aggregate function because it doesn't matter if they have no rows in their queue, all right, or if they have a million rows in their queue. We just want one number, right? So we don't want to see the detail. We don't need to see every row in the queue for that person. We just need to know one number, the highest number um, in uh, the highest number for position in that. Now, you're probably right. We could do count, all right? Because, again, it should be one, two, three. You know, the third thing that they add in, there should already be two, all right? So we could do that. Yes? Isn't there a built-in aggregate function for finding the highest? Yes, there is. And what's the name of that function? Max. Max. So we're going to select max. So we're going to say select max position from Q. Is that all we need? We don't need to know where user ID equals right. whatever. Right. We need to only do it for the specific user. Right? This would give me the, the highest number of anyone's position. We don't want that. So we'll say where user ID equals question mark. All right? So we now know part of the answer to number one. And we know the answer for number two. The part that, that I would guess would be fuzzy for you at this point is, okay, I know this is a query. How do I get the result of this query into the variable highest? So that's our challenge. We want to do how, how do we get the, the result of this query in the variable highest? Yes? Do we have to do a group by? You tell me. Do we have yeah, to do a group by? I thought by? you said whenever we use the aggregate functions, we have to do group by. If there's more than one number. All right. You, you, you're, both, you're, both, you're, both, you're both saying partially true statements. What is the true true statement? The true statement is, is I have to use a group by if I want more than one total, if I want to break down the totals by something, if I want to group the totals by something. In this case, I'm not grouping the totals by anything. I'm filtering out, and I'm picking that one specific user, and I just want to know the one value of the maximum. I'm not breaking it down by user. Now, let's consider another sort of SQL statement that we might write, where as, let's say, we wanted to see how many customers there were by state. All right? That's a different kind of SQL statement, where we want to see that these are our Indiana customers, these are our Ohio customers, these are our Pennsylvania customers. In that case, we're not getting one line of totals, we're getting three lines of totals. And they're broken down by state. So therefore, we'd have to use a group by in this case, because we want to group the totals. We don't want one total for everything. We want to group it by something. We want it subtotaled by something. So that is sort of the determination whether it's a group by. So if we add this, the SQL statement will look something like this. Select state count star from customer um, group by state. So that would say, okay, we want the totals. 
but we want them broken down by state. The rule that I said is that if you have anything that's not an aggregate function here, it has to be in the group by. In this case, everything in our select is an aggregate function, so we don't need a group by. And why is that? Because we only want one total. How many rows is this going to return? How many, how many rows is this going to return in the result set? One. What if the person doesn't have any movies in their queue? How many rows will it return? No. Pardon me? No. I mean, we're Good guess. Okay. But no. How many do you think will return if they have none? Well, how many? What is the maximum position if? Zero. Yeah, zero. It's going to return to zero. All right. Um, that's actually a good question. We'll have, to, we'll have to test that. The count may actually be better in this case because we're going to count it. The count will always be a value. This may actually turn out to be null. So that, that's a good point. It might be null. Good for you. I, I stand corrected now that I think about that. When I've done this example previously, I've done it with count, which guarantees that there's going to be. All right. But the bottom line is there will be one row in this result set no matter what. There's a million of them, there will be one row that says the, the, the count or the maximum. If there is uh, none of them, there will be one row that either says null or says, um, um, yeah, zero. All right. So let's go in and let's implement this. So really our challenge here, we know the SQL statement. We know the arithmetic statement that follows. We, we know from last time, or at least we saw from last time, the code that we have to connect to the database, all right, and to execute a SQL statement. But now we have to sort of tweak that, not to do an insert like we did last time, but to do a query where we pull the data. And a query is different than an insert, right? Um, inserts, updates, and deletes are all very similar. Right? They're an operation that we perform on the database that either succeeds or fails. A query is something different because a query not only succeeds or fails, it returns no rows or it returns multiple rows. So we have to be able to examine the results of the query. And it's not going to be a binary succeed or fail. It's going to be, okay, um, here's, the six, you know, here's the six customers, or here's the six states we have customers for in their total. So it will return six rows. Here's the count for that user returns one row. So let's go and let's look at how we're going to code that select row. Register for 13 through 18 credit hours at LC and pay for only 13. Probably every student on campus is happy for that rule except for the students in CISS 232. And, and students in this class too, right? Because we do that to it. That's what, that's what mucks up the tuition calculation because otherwise it would just be the hours times rate. We did it in Java too. We did it in Java too? Yeah. 
get a lot of mileage out of that yeah. one, eh? All right, so let's go and pull down. The example from last time. Specifically, it's going to be in the code behind. All right. If we look here, we have the objects that we need to connect to the database here. So we don't need another data source. We can use the same data source for selecting and for inserting because there can be a select statement associated with a data source, an insert, an update, and a delete. So I don't have to redeclare these variables. Remember, we declared these last time um, for, a, um, for doing the insert. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say <coughs> objds that select command equals select, and I'm not going to attempt fate, I'm going to do count, and you can gloat a little bit if you want, from Q, where user ID equals, and ordinarily would put a question mark in there, all right, because we don't, in fact, know what the user ID is. So I'm going to put this code in. from a session variable. Now, we're not talking about session variables to the second part of the discussion, but the one thing I can do is, again, remember this 
part of the, the demonstration of this is showing how we can like fake something until it works. All right. I'm going to go into my initial page and I'm going to pretend that there's a login on this page. And I'm going to set that session variable equal to 1. As soon as we go to this app, it defaults the session value to, to 1. We'll talk more about session values later, but keep in mind that the session variables are a mechanism by which you can pass data from page to page. So if I set that session ID, I'm sorry, if I set that user ID as a session variable to 1 on this page, it'll be equal to 1 when I get over here. And I could use that on any page. tell it to treat it like a string because the function is expecting a, a string. All right. We'll try this. This should work. Um, if there's an issue, we'll go back and correct it. But I'm adding a user ID and I'm treating it like a string. All right. Actually, this way because this is an integer. All right. So what I'm doing is I'm adding my user ID. I'm telling it that this is this parameter is an integer by using the system data type db type enumeration and I'm saying the value comes from the session ID. All right. 
I then am going to create